at him. And he doesn't look like a, a, a fascist or a Nazi to me. I think he's 63. You look at his nose, he looks like he drinks a little bit too much. He's unshaven. It seems a very, very odd image for the far right to have. So I thought today we'd look, in, look a little bit into Steve Bannon. And what's quite interesting is if you do a Google search of Steve Bannon racist, in the last day, you get ex-Obama staffer sounds alarm on racist Steve Bannon, time to break the glass because of emergency. President Bannon, racist, Islamophobic, Breitbart leader consolidates power in Trump White House. That's seven hours ago. Bannon's last job was peddling racism, conspiracies, but Trump gives him a, a top national security seat. That's a day ago. So the Spanish press or the Catalan press are getting this rubbish from somewhere. And yeah, there's more articles here. I got this one from The Guardian. Steve Bannon is calling the shots in the White House. That's terrifying. And you notice the URL is Steve Bannon, most dangerous man in America. More here. How Donald Trump is bringing the alt-right to the White House. And I found this one in Mother Jones, which is pretty loaded. I mean, this is a little bit more balanced. So it, it, it gives you an idea of how insane the reporting is in the so-called liberal media. Let's have a quick look through this. Is Steve Bannon racist? Let's find out. Unsurprisingly, Donald Trump chose Steve Bannon, his campaign chairman, to be his chief strategist in the White House. No one quite knows what that means, but at the very least, it means he'll have the ear of the president for the next year. But what kind of person is Steve Bannon? President-elect Trump's choice of Steve Bannon as his top aide signals that white supremacists will be represented at the highest levels in Trump's White House, said Adam Gentleson, a spokesman for Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid, in a statement Sunday last night. It is easy to see why the KKK views Trump as their champion, when Trump appoints one of the foremost peddlers of white supremacist themes and rhetoric as his top aide. Bannon was the main driver behind Breitbart becoming a white ethno-nationalist propaganda mill, according to the Southern Poverty Law Centre. OK, so the, the two quotes are from Harry Reid, very, very partisan Democrat, and the Southern Poverty Law Centre. And I think we might have to do a video on the Southern Poverty Law Centre, um, who describes people like Ayan Hirsi Ali or Majid Nawaz as uh, Islamophobes. So um, they're hardly unbiased, really. The reason why he's an anti-Semite, apparently, Bannon's ex-wife swore in court in 2007 that he didn't want the girls going to a school with Jews. He said he didn't doesn't like Jews. The, the reason why, apparently, he's an anti-Semite is because of some claims by his ex-wife during their breakup. Who knows whether they're true? Apparently, he didn't like the school his children were being sent to. In private, people say lots of stupid things and off-the-cuff remarks that actually have nothing to do with our political views. OK, Bannon was head of Breitbart News, which embraced the alt-right. Breitbart itself explains how the alt-right has absolutely nothing to do with white supremacism. There are many things that separate the alternative right from old school racist skinheads to whom they are often idiotically compared. But one thing stands out above all else, intelligence. Skinheads, by and large, are low information, low IQ thugs driven by the thrill of violence and tribal hatred. The alternative right are a much smarter group of people, which perhaps suggests why the left hates them so much. They're dangerously bright. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is the thing. The alternative right, I've got no idea what I am now. But people like Milo Yiannopoulos, Fox Day and Mike Cernovich, there's something kind of punky and radical about them. And they're fun. And they, they rather than being racist, the intelligent ones that I've spoken to, um, the Richard Spencers, I've got no idea. But the, the ones that I've read and seen interviewed, they don't strike me as being racist in the slightest. They're very much anti-establishment, uh, but often, not in the case of Milo Yiannopoulos, but often defending core values such as family and basic stuff. They're, they're straight. In most, in most cases, they're kind of straight-talking guys, which is something kind of refreshing. The views of the alt-right are widely seen as anti-Semitic and white supremacist. Most of its members are young white men who see themselves first and foremost as champions of their own demographic. 
However, apart from their allegiance to their tribe, as they call it, their greatest point of unity lie in what they are against, multiculturalism, immigration, feminism, and above all, political correctness. Okay, multiculturalism is a political ideology that brings other groups into your country and says you should value and celebrate their culture above your own. I think this is insane. I'm a, an immigrant to Catalonia, and one of the reasons why I've been successful here is I speak the language almost to native level, and I have integrated massively. I think if you move to another country, you have an, an obligation, a moral obligation, to integrate as much as you can. Immigration. Mass immigration is a bad idea. Feminism. Third wave, wave feminism has completely lost its plot. First wave feminism, about a hundred years ago, got women the vote. Second wave feminism in the 60s got women equal opportunities. Current third wave feminism is Marxist-inspired lunacy that is involved in hating white men, principally. And above all, political correctness. Political correctness is just madness. It's very much, it's used as a way to, to censor other people's speech. And it, it, it's a way of shutting down ideas. Somebody like me, I'm utterly and completely against political correctness. I kind of enjoy telling jokes where characters in the jokes, and there's a difference between some kind of crass insult and quite simply talking about black people or gays or women in your jokes. I remember the black comedian, Lenny Henry, the black comedian, British comedian Lenny Henry, being accused of being an Uncle Tom because in his sketches, this is in the 80s, because in his sketches he took the piss out of black people. And he said, you know, like, but I'm black. Who on earth else can I possibly take the piss out of? And there's a kind of... Certainly in the last 15 years or so, I think most free-thinking people realise that political correctness has gone utterly and completely crazy. The accusations of, of anti-Semitism have been completely poo-pooed by Ben Shapiro, who's a conservative who used to, a Jewish conservative, who used to work for Bannon. Um, he does criticise Bannon to, to a certain extent, basically because they had an argument and didn't really get on. But Andrew Bytemark despised race, racism, truly despised it. Racism is just nuts. I don't think anybody remotely intelligent can believe that racism is a good idea. And OK, what Breitbart does have, and if you look at the, some of the headlines, what Breitbart does have, and particularly Milo Yiannopoulos, is a, is a mischievous lack of political correctness. So headlines like, birth control makes women unattractive and crazy. Hoist it high and proud, the Confederate flag proclaims a glorious heritage. Would you rather your child had feminism or cancer? This is, a, this is a, an online poll that Milo Yiannopoulos did. And people came, came out wildly in favour. They, they decided they'd much rather their child had cancer than feminism. And Gabby Giffords, the gun control movement's human shield. Yeah, here's a photo of the staff at Breitbart, and there's a black guy uh, on the staff. And they say, oh, but, but it's not really anti-racist because he's the token black guy. It's utterly ridiculous. You can't win with these people. Let's have a look at what they say uh, on the main media channels. This guy has written, a, had interviewed Steve Bannon. He seems to me to be an overly sensitive liberal who's really upset about what Steve Bannon is like. Explain the convoluted uh, reactions we're getting to Bannon. Some saying, hold on, he's a great guy. Others saying he should not be there at all. Well, I think very few people are saying he's a great guy. I think most, most people I've heard are, a few people say that, uh, just well, for the record, I, I, I would, have. Well, I would certainly say that he is, he is a, a, a remarkably intelligent f guy, full of energy and, in fact, vision. Um, I think the other reaction is is coming because he kind of invites it. Mm -hmm. um, I think he has found it very helpful, and I think the Trump campaign, um, now administration or forthcoming administration, has found it helpful to create this sense of conflict. Mm -hmm. And I think for Bannon's point that he's the um, 
the soul of darkness now is um, is is that the media and liberals perceive him to be that therefore they they miss what's really going on and they miss the fact that um, that the, that the Trump campaign was um, caught on fire, caught the imagination of the nation. Yes, it did. Uh, Jeremy Peters, you spent time with Ben and spoke with him last week. Did you, did you see the soul of darkness? <laughs> Someone asked me to describe him the other day, like, you know, just as, as, as a person. Yeah. And I said, if you sat down and had dinner with Steve Bannon, you would probably come away from it thinking, wow, this is one of the most interesting people I've ever met. And I think that part of the issue with the, uh, the, 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 the negative perception he has in the media right now is because Steve Steve is not known. He, people do not know who he is. People in the media, people in politics. So he's a blank slate. So mm -hmm. the Democrats have been very successful at painting a caricature of him by drawing out some of the really ugly stuff that Breitbart has printed and, and associating that, blaming Steve for that. And it's not been helpful. And Trump's problem, the whole, you know, the whole Trump campaign's problem all along has been they haven't bothered to correct these perceptions because they just don't seem to care, but that's yeah. go not going to be a sustainable approach going forward. You see, I kind of disagree with this. I mean, I, th I think that they have really set out in a calculated way to create this kind of, this kind of conflict. Um, they're not talking to, they're not talking to the, to the media, they're not talking to liberals, or to the extent that they are talking to that group of people, it's to bait them and um, um, make them angry and that kind of reaction does their job for them. Their people, the, 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 more, the more the media is shock shock, the more the Trump country is, um, it seems to be delighted. I mean, I think this is the point is, is the, as he says, it's the, the reaction that people have to the alternative right, call them what you will, or this, this kind of new these new political movements, the people that, like me, who are generally in favour of Trump. I mean, I can only speak from my own personal experience. I'm frequently called Nazi, racist, xenophobe, bigots. I, I was out actually a couple of days ago and we had lunch with a very good friend who happens to be black. And we don't necessarily agree on on all political issues, but like we're like really good friends. And he, I was kind of joking about this. And he was, he was kind of looking at me, he said, but you must have done something, Simon. And I, I said, well, well, no, I just simply openly say that I'm, I support Trump and that's it. And uh, he just kind of looked at the situation in a completely baffled way. And I suppose the truth is when you know that you're not any of the things that people accuse you of being, then after a while, you just t start having a flip attitude. I'm, in fact, on a, on a comment board yesterday, somebody said that um, Simon Harris is a bigot and I'm going to do what I can to have him removed from this group. Uh, and I think my res response was a bit sarcastic. You kind of missed this on, oh, yes, I really hate gays, don't I? Which was a sarcastic response, but that um, initiated a whole flutter of, look, uh, he's come out and admitted it. So the fact that these people don't have a sense of humour uh, means that I'm sure Trump and Bannon and you just don't take them seriously. And so I'm not sure whether it's actually baiting, but you say what you think and then people can come up with, with, with whatever stupid conclusions they like and you don't bother to rectify because, I mean, my view is that if somebody calls me a racist without knowing who I am or knowing what I've done, is that's a slur. That's a, that's an insult. That's a, a black mark of my on my character. And you don't know who I am, so the person that does that simply doesn't deserve my respect. I, I and I think the the whole mistaken way of coming back and saying. No, actually getting into the argument and trying to defend yourself is a complete waste of time. So what tends to happen, once that's happened a few times, you tend to be flip about it. And I think this is what's happened to uh, Steve Bannon and Donald Tr Trump and, and lots of people in this group. I suppose there is a little bit of winding them up. But anyway, just to find out who Steve Bannon is, let's have a look. Steve, this is from Wikipedia, as I've said before. It's not unbiased, it tends to be liberal, but you get the basic facts here. 
Uh, Steve Ke Stephen Kevin Steve Bannon, born November 27, 1953, is the assistant to the president and chief strategist for United States President Donald Trump. Since January 28, 2017, Bannon has also been a regular attendee of the Principals Committee of the National Security Council. Prior to assuming those positions, Bannon was chief executive officer of Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Before his political career, Bannon served as executive chair of Breitbart News, a far-right news, opinion and commentary website, which Bannon describes as the platform of the internet-based alt-right. I did a Google search for Steve Bannon and I found a quote, and I couldn't see this at any point coming out of Steve Bannon's mouth. And I think there's also another point about the Breitbart editorial content. To a certain extent, Steve Bannon was Andrew Breitbart's heir. And I think I'll make a video about Andrew Breitbart at some time. But Andrew Breitbart bought, brought back this kind of confrontational, to a certain extent, aggressive right-wing approach that has been so long used by the left. Because often it's often the case that people like Bannon, Breitbart, I'm obviously not in the same league, but I come from the left. So... I'm kind of quite used to being forthright about things and using left-wing tactics. I've used them all my life. All of a sudden, we find ourselves disagreeing with a political position, but not having changed our basic attitudes. So you, you end up using more aggressive tactics than have been typical of the so-called conservatives. And the left are surprised, and they're all, all of a sudden they're shocked that they're using your tactics back on them. And I think that's another reason why these people are so vilified. But once again, it's always using far right, alt right. And this is even in Wikipedia. Bannon took leave of absence from Breitbart in order to work for the campaign. After the election, he announced he would resign from Breitbart. So he's no longer associated with Breitbart. But Breitbart is, is a voice of conservative opinion, so-called conservative opinion. But I think conservative... 40 years on from the punk revolution in 1977, I think conservatism is the new punk. So uh, I'm having fun with it, really. Yeah, he was born in 1953. His working class Irish Catholic family were pro-Kennedy, pro-Union Democrats. He graduated from Virginia Tech, etc. People come from working class families, pro-Kennedy, pro-Union Democrat, a little bit like me, working class family, pro-left wing all my life, basically because my political views, rather than being ideological, if I was left wing, it was because I was defending the, yeah, I was fighting for the the demographic I came from, which was the working class. I, I've tried to, um, I don't think it's even white in my, my case, because my part of Nottingham, even in the 60s, we took in the massive immigration, and I kind of grew up in a very, very black community, and there were never any problems. Uh, and I think a lot of the immigration problems are, are the new immigrants and the ideological problems that Islam presents. And you have to be honest about it. And it's, so it's not really a question of colour of skin, but new Im immigrants coming in drive down wages, so are not beneficial to, and I like to use the word incumbent working class. So I would describe the incumbent working class as people of whatever colour who've been there for a few generations. So if you all of a sudden get thousands and thousands of people coming in, it doesn't matter what colour you are. There are communities where, very happy communities that are mixed race, certainly in the north of England and have been for, for decades. But if you suddenly get a new and added 15, 20% to your community from people from outside who drive wages down, then that's not in your benefit, is it? And so people like... These people in the States and people like me, both in England and, and Catalonia, I'm defending the rights of the people that have been here for some time um, without be being too too soft about, oh, we've got to love immigrants. No, immigrants have to come here and assimilate. That's my view. OK, he was a Navy, Navy officer. Then he had a business career and he was involved in Goldman Sachs, got, has been involved in the environmental se sector. And then film and media, and he made various documentaries on kind of right-wing issues. He was a particular supporter, as was Andrew Breitbart. 
um, the founder of Breitbart News, they were particular supporters of the Tea Party. And it's kind of interesting when you look at the Tea Party. The Tea Party was so vilified. Sarah Palin was treated as being so stupid. I, I mean, I believed this at the time. But both Breitbart and Bannon believed that the Tea Party were the bedrock of American society. Ordinary, um, middle class, generally women, getting together and creating a political movement. So he made this film yeah, here, Undefeated on Sarah Palin. Um, Sarah Palin has been... People have laughed at Sarah Palin for her stupidity. And both Breitbart and Bannon were ma are massive defenders of, of her. I mean, that's it. That's it. How do you get... I think she's a, she was a fisherman's wife to being a, a world a, a world famous politician, a much vilified world famous politician, without having some kind of ability. Governor of Alaska, one of the most famous American politicians, she failed. But the the Bannon generation, the Trump generation, it seems to me have worked on the Tea Party, and one of the reasons why the left and the liberals. Um, hate them so much is they haven't made the same mistakes as the, the Tea Party and throwing out this racist, sexist, xenophobe insults doesn't work. And they have also, they haven't fallen into the trap of coming across as being not very intelligent because having these opinions and, in, and intelligence today, I think there's a, a strong correlation. Being politically incorrect is a mark of intelligence in my opinion. Bannon was founding mem member of the board of Breitbart News, a far-right news and opinion commentary website. And in March 2012, after founder Andrew Mike Breitbart's death, Bannon became executive chair of Breitbart News. Then he got involved in the campaign. We won't, won't go too deeply into the campaign because in many respects, it's since he got involved in the last stage of Donald Trump's campaign that people have come to, to know his name. And he's criticised by, OK, his main opposition from the Anti-Defamation League, who are a left-wing left group of moaners, the Council on American Islamic Relations, who are uh, a Muslim Brotherhood-related group, and the Southern Poverty Law Centre, again, a bunch of left-wing loonies. The, the, this, these people really are the loony left and Democrat Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid, etc., etc. OK, in order to finish, I think the best thing is, obviously all the links are going to be in the description, but let's have a, just have a look at a, a clip of... This is um, Steve Bannon uh, a couple of years ago speaking to a local grassroots, uh, grassroots American group. OK, they're conservatives, but do you think... The ad hominems, fascist, racist, xenophobe, homophobe, Islamophobe, are appropriate for a guy like this. Let's just watch a couple of minutes. I really recommend you watch the whole of this video because he kind of lays, as it says, Steve Bannon lays out his amazing political philosophy. The reason the Tea Party, after Santelli's rant, the reason the Tea Party revolt came about, it's the first time in our country's history that we've had a center-right movement principally led by women, right? If you look at the Tea Party, for the Jasons and all the guys, and I was out there in the, in the America's First Prosperity and all the guys, this was the first time there were women out there, right, moms. And the reason it is is that women's are the, the women are the chief operating officer of the American family. You know, they don't need to know which trains of dollars. They know that every bag of groceries is 100 bucks. They know to fill up an SUV is 100 bucks. And they know that Buddy and Sis are going to a state college, state university, coming back $50,000 in debt and living back in, the, you know, in their room with the soccer trophies they got with, 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 no, with no job prospects. The reason I named the first film Generation Zero, the, the generation in their 20s and 30s, we, we've wiped them out. This is the first time in American history a generation's actually cha you know, given over command of something and we haven't passed on any positive increase in net worth. Right? The sad thing about the Occupy Wall Street, when you look at those kids, is how ill-informed they are. That's the product. That's the product of the American education system. They have no more earthly idea of the fundamentals of our liberty, the fundamentals of free market capitalism, and they know absolutely nothing about our history.
why I call them Generation Zero. We've passed on zero net worth, and we've really, you know, and, and yet I see part of that, my daughter's part of that generation, that are fighting a war that's tougher than any war that our grandparents fought. Okay, uh, I mean, here he is, uh, d this supposed sexist, becoming a champion for the Tea Party because it's a mainly a women's movement. And basically what he's talking about is, and the reason why people like me and people like Bannon, I suppose, have abandoned what the left has become, is the left no, no longer defends the average working person. And as he says, the reason why mothers are important is they know what things cost and they know how few opportunities their children have. And I think it's just massively sad that we're, for as a result of political decisions, we're in, we're in a state where the next generation is going to be worse off than we are. In our family and my, my partner's sons, one's doing quite well, basically because he's, he's gone abroad and he's set up his own business. The other, the other one's finished two engineering degrees and is unemployed. And then our niece is doing practice in companies and basically stages in companies and basically not getting paid for it. And none of these kids, like had this happened to me when I came, came out of university, I'd have been up in arms. And I think it's completely appalling. So the reason why I'm on board with people like Bannon, people like Trump, is you have to make the working class and middle class classes prosperous again. You have to make it possible for a working class guy working hard at the factory to send his kids through university and his kids to, to join the middle classes. Uh, and that there's nothing mad or right wing or, or xenophobic about this. And basically, I think most people of, of my political positions view is you have to favour the people that are already here. And there's this kind of broad idea of civic nationalism. So civic nationalism actually doesn't involve any racism. And, and it's, it's what, I, what I call the, uh, the, the incumbent working class or the incumbent community. Basically, um, the reason why I'm so Catalan is I've embraced the culture. I know when I'm making these videos, I'm making these videos in English. But I think you have to embrace the culture. You have to learn the language. You have to get involved in the community. And then if you do that, it doesn't really matter what colour you are or where you come from, but you have to be an active community member. And if you do that, then after a reasonable period of time, then you will have as many rights as anybody is there. And they're right when they talk about the US was based on immigrants. Much of Europe, uh, Europe is based on immigration. But the, the way immigrants gain respect is by becoming part of the community and useful members of society. People that come here and want social security handouts immediately and free this, free that. Well, they don't demand the same respect, in my opinion. And before we finish, let's watch another section of Steve Bannon. But the, the point is, he doesn't really look like a racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, lunatic, alt-right lunatic to me. Another short section, just, just so you get a feeling for what kind of person he is. And these are the people that are, as Rick Santelli so brilliantly observed, they're those who carry the water, not those who drink the water. They're the ones that hold our social organizations together, build our cities, run our little leagues, fight our wars, right? It's the backbone of this country. And they're enraged, and here's why they're enraged. They understand we have a system now that has socialism, as you point out so eloquently. We have socialism for the very poor, right? A system that a trillion dollars a year in welfare state benefits with no taxes, right? And 60% of the country getting that. And we have socialism for the very wealthy, right? The, the, the anger of the Tea Party is not racism. It's not, they're not homophobes. They're not nativist. What they are is common sense, practical, middle class people that understand that they're paying for their own and their children's destruction. Right? And that's the rage. You know, the bonus pool this year, the bonus pool on Wall Street of all the financial firms in 2000 in seven, the year before, in 2006 and 2007, the two years were all the transactions that imploded in 2008. The bonus pool is, is going to be about the same this year, right? 
you know, TARP, when you when said TARP or TARP, if, if our business, if your business or your business had gotten in trouble and Goldman Sachs, where I was trained, had come in and given you a, a, a financing, trust me, you would have been wiped out and you would have been fired, right? They weren't. All their stock is still is worth a ton of money because they weren't. We basically gave them free money. You see, I mean, the point he's making, he, he calls it socialism. I was a socialist, but I suppose it's collectivism, statism, the current mad si system that benefits the very poor who don't really contribute to, to society. And I totally agree. I, I believe in the welfare state. I think we need a safety net. I think we need a decent health, health system. I think we need a decent education system, not a propaganda system. We need these things and they need to be paid for by our taxes. I would be more big government than many people in the States. But essentially, it's a safety net. It's not, it shouldn't be, be a, a way of giving people uh, who don't contribute to society a free ride. And it shouldn't be a way of creating the poverty trap. I know lots of people who became unemployed in 2008, 2009, and after eight or nine, and they were, they were in their early 20s then, uh, mid-20s then, now they're in their mid-30s, they haven't really worked for about a decade, and they've got very lazy, and they kind of scratch around doing odd jobs, making a bit of money here, drinking too much, and the poverty trap is a really bad thing. He doesn't ma mention that, but this is another reason why I'm kind of against a lot of these, this excessive uh, dependence on, on welfare. And also at the same time, the way the super rich can escape their res responsibilities. So, and this, this also happens in Spain. Massive corruption, massive bank bailouts. So the people who are actually working slogging away for 40 hours a week, trying to pay, pay, pay their rent, trying to bring up kids, just can't get ahead. And I think this is fundamentally wrong. And people like Steve Bannon and hopefully President Trump and the, and the, the whole change coming about in politics is, yes, it's focusing, giving priority to the people.